Welcome to the AmericanaMusic.com podcast with your host, Sarah Popejoy. Welcome to AmericanaMusic.com. Today we are delighted to have Willie Watts. He has a beautiful vibrato voice if you've never heard Willie before. He was a founding member of the Old Crow Medicine Show. Since then, he struck out solo. He's here to talk about his third album, self-titled Willie Watson. Willie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Sarah. Glad to be here to talk to you. Willie, when you grew up, you grew up in state New York around the Finger Lakes region. And tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up there in upstate New York. Well, the Finger Lakes are a beautiful place. There's lakes and a lot of waterfalls, gorges that that are cut out by waterfalls. They're in people's backyards along the lakes. And there's a national forest in between Watkins Glen and Trumansburg, Seneca Lake and Cayuga Lake. There's national forests all over the place. There's farms. It's a lot of dairy. That's sort of outside of town. But... Growing up in the system there, I don't know if it was just New York State or what the rest of this country was like, but it was pretty harsh. People yell at each other a lot around there. The winters are really long. You know, it's like mm-hmm. eight months of winter. And by the end of it, everyone's so mad at each other. And <laughs> year after year, it just piles up and, and and everybody just ends up really angry and cold. So that harshness, what, what do, you, do you think it's from the winters or just... It might spill over over from the city and just the culture that's around the Northeast, uh-huh. New England and, and New York State and the, you know, also Pennsylvania. People are just a little more worked up. You know, I live on the West Coast right now and, you know, it's that typical stereotype like, hey, dude, you know, hang loose, bro. And that's true. People are really relaxed and hanging loose out here. Back there in the East, especially in the North, people aren't hanging loose. Definitely a completely different culture from where you were and where you are now, which is in Los Angeles, correct? Yeah, I've lived out here for 20 years now. Wow. There's a story on your website of a chance encounter with a man named Ruby Love. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? I was in high school and I'd been dabbling in old country music, old fiddle music, and also the local music scene around Ithaca was full of fiddles and banjos. And I was interested in it, but it wasn't really readily available. I was excited about Ruby coming. I tell the story in depth on the record. Oh, okay. And so once this record comes out, people are going to hear every detail of that story. Oh, that's great to know. Yeah. But it's an important story to me because it was a real turning point that I didn't realize was happening. I was a teenager and my life is is just happening around me. And here's this huge moment. Wow, I'm trying to explain it, but you have to hear it. You have to hear the song before I can give this little explanation or summary of it. But it's a huge turning point where all this stuff yeah. is coming together. My my first feelings of, of pain that were recognized as pain that I knew hurt were coming together with a solution that I didn't know was the solution. There was hope being offered to me right in front of me in the most blatant and obvious way. Wow. And that I took that offering, you know, from what I believe is a godsend. Right. But that story just, you know, if you it, it doesn't necessarily spell it out so clearly like I just described. But if you listen and if you know anything about me already, I think it comes into focus for the listener. That's really neat. In our interview on the website, AmericanaMusic.com, you talk about singing being a direct line with God. Um, Can you tell me a little bit about, you know, your theories on that? Sometimes I'm just so awestruck by the power of music and the power that just one note can carry. And it's just, you know, it's like that thing where you, you don't really think about the stars or the sky or the moon every day. But sometimes you look at the moon and you're just like, man. That's crazy. You know, I can't believe that thing's up there in space. And it's like that with music. There's times where I don't fully realize its power, you know, and you take it for granted just like you would the sky above. And there's those times where it it dawns on me again how powerful songs and notes are and what they mean to people. And I think about music in, you know, early man making the first music, however that was made, you know, and not just beating on a drum, but like notes. It's so primitive. And if, and, if, and if I think about it in that way, you know, two cavemen sitting there, one makes a flute, 
and what that other caveman must have thought and how powerful a feeling that is. It is magical and mystical, and I feel like it's a thing that binds people together like nothing else that we know of. Wow. Regarding the, the telephone line to heaven, I know that when I sing, that's the closest spiritual connection I've ever felt to anything. I don't even know what it is. It overtakes me. It overtakes my body. It overtakes my chest. It overtakes my throat, my feet. I'm possessed. And it's a good possession. You know, it doesn't feel like a demon's in there. Sometimes, maybe, but for the <laughs> most part, it, for the most part, it's a real beautiful, beautiful thing that that brings me together with everyone else in the room. That's beautiful. I love that. Good. Cool. Your first two solo albums after leaving Old Crow Medicine Show uh, were called Folk Singer. How does your new album differ? Can you talk about how it's different from your last two? Those first two records were real safe for me to be able to sing those songs that I knew were good. I didn't write them. I didn't have to question their quality or their validity of them. So I knew the material was strong. I just had to perform them well. It was real safe. And I was able to lean on those old songs and get by. I had high hopes that it was going to be bigger, that I was going to really be the new folk singer to bring it all back and, and show the people that I didn't have to write songs to be good and I didn't have to write the songs for you guys to like me as much as I wanted you all to like me. It didn't work out that way. It fizzled out. It fell off, got off track. People just didn't care anymore. Did I care? Yeah, but not as much as I could or not as much as I wanted to. And I just wasn't ever really doing what I've wanted to be doing. When I was 16, writing my first song, it came to me really easy. And I tried to write a few more and they were hard. And that threw me off track because I was already hard enough on myself. And so I sort of stopped. And then I met some people that I could write songs with, Catch and Critter and all the guys on Old Crow Medicine Show. I wrote songs with them and felt great about it and felt like I was fulfilling all my artistic desires and anything I needed to say was getting said and I was fully realized as me. And so the folk singer thing was backtracking, but it was safe and I was going to pay the bills. And so now at 44 years old, finally, I can shake off all that fear, not worry about what anyone else is going to think of it. In fact, people think it's good and not compare myself and what it is to anything else on the radio. But in fact, when I do, I actually like it. And the big difference about this one is that this record made me like the artist, Willie Watson. I've never really been a big fan of Willie Watson. I watch footage of myself on YouTube and I think someone needs to tell that guy to chill out. And I hear my voice on the records and I think, man, if I could have just heard myself when I recorded that song, I could have sung it better and it wouldn't have been so scratchy. So now's the time for me to do all those things and not let anyone else tell me how to do it or what to do. And I listen to this record and I look at the picture on the cover and I, and I think, I like that guy. I like his face and I want to hear the songs he's got got to sing. And it makes me not like Bob Dylan as much as I used to. It makes me not like all the stuff, all my heroes anymore. I like, I'm a bigger Willie Watson fan than I am a Bob Dylan fan now. When I heard your song, Real Love, you have a a voice unlike anybody else. It, it reaches to your core quickly, is how I would describe it, through your vibrato and just, it, it's really special. Yeah, um, thanks, Sarah. I appreciate um, that. It's good to hear. So tell me a little bit about real love what it was about what in maybe what inspired it that was one of those songs that the chorus popped into my head in the car i was driving home and the chorus was just there in my head in place and the chords to the song were there the whole song were already in place i just had to get home and fill in the blanks so i got home and recorded the little bit that i was sure about the chords and that chorus scratched out a few notes on my phone and then i think in the next few days got together with my songwriting partner morgan nagler and we wrote it pretty quick we wrote it in about maybe four hours which is pretty fast and it just started out as a love song but the verses started taking on timelines and the first verse was kind of my early life and the second verse kind of my middle section and then the last verse is kind of more about now and it ended up being about all my relationships with everybody old girlfriends and old wives and old friends and family and it just started exploring that and examining it and being able to put it into trying to summarize a life in three no, verses. Cool. And, you know, it, I don't know that I, I don't think I summarized the whole life in three verses, but I look at it and it really does say a lot about the love I've tried to look for my whole life. It could take a lifetime to find. Once we found each other, it sort of erased all of that past and all of those resentments. Any darkness was just gone and we we're ready to move forward in the most beautiful way. I love 
love that. It's a great song. That's actually how I was introduced to you was hearing that song. Oh, cool. Um, tell us about your either funniest or most memorable moments while touring. Oh, well, not even touring, but I got to play at Ringo Starr's birthday party. I got to sing three Ringo Starr songs for Ringo Starr at Ringo Starr's birthday. Oh. And then cool. I know, cool. but I couldn't believe I was, first of all, just going to get to meet a Beatle. I never thought I'd even come into close contact with, with a yeah. Beatle. And so that was cool. But then at the end, he was on his way out. He was getting whisked away. And I managed to get in there and, and just wanted to thank him for, for having me and giving me the opportunity to be there. And, and he turned around and he was so gracious. And he said, oh, thank He said, thank you. And he said to me, you've got some pipes on you, don't you? And he grabbed I wish you could see the video. He grabbed my throat. He kind of grabbed gently. He sort of touched my neck and, and wiggled my vocal cords around and said, you've really got some pipes on you, don't you? And gave me a big <laughs> smile and, he, and a hug. And then he took a picture. So oh, that was my most recent mind-blowing sort of musical touring gigging experience. I hope that's, that's a good a, enough story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a great story. Wow. Well, I can't even imagine meeting one of the Beatles. He, um, he handles himself so well. He, was, he turned 84 or 83 and was full of energy. He was bouncing around, greeting everybody, very gracious, just a, a gentleman through and through. That's good to know. And it's always good when uh, you, you meet one of your heroes and... and you know, they, uh, they don't disappoint you. They, you know, yeah, it's, it's a good experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause it can go the other way sometimes. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in the bio that I, uh, read on your site, you say that every memory, maybe not the one with Ringo Starr, but mm. every memory is surrounded by a shroud of sadness, whether it's good or bad. And you can, can you expand on that for me a little, or that's a heavy, uh, statement, but I also see a little bit of where you're going with it. Yeah. It's heavy. Yeah. It's about as heavy as it can get. And I think it's me looking back at the past in the most realistic way possible and being completely honest and looking at, at anything that I did or someone did or anything that happened or and not having any denial at all. Mm, it's hard to, to have a realistic picture of the past when you when you take full ownership of some of the things that you've been mm -hmm. and you look at that time, ways that you might have been and at the time might have been a lie. And that's a hard thing to look at later on. And whether or not that shroud and darkness or that veil of sadness is is real or not, it's hard to see through it because there's so much around it that there's so much weight on on my shoulders. And it's hard to differentiate how much blame to take for something, how much yeah. responsibility. And years later, you look at that and it's really hard to sort through. And I think, I guess I'm just saying that I, I, I suppose I'd maybe like to make a disclaimer about anything I say. <laughs> and that is that <laughs> I'm not sure how true it all is. And these are just my perceptions. And, I, and what I right. really want to say is that I'm at a point of being so stripped down that that I'm absolutely willing to be wrong about anything I'm saying right now. And, and I'm saying it to put it out there in hopes that someone might come and say, hey, hey, you know, maybe it, it's not so bad. Maybe I'm putting that out there as a, maybe I'm fishing when I say that in my bio. Maybe I hope well, someone will call me up, hoping someone's going to call me and say, no, no, it wasn't that bad. Maybe it's both, right, too? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, of course. Yeah, you know, if you were to flip it around and say every bit of sadness had some sort of joy in it somewhere. Sure. But but it made me think, that's for sure. I remember I was sitting in this concert, Mary Chip Carpenter. I got a phone call. It was so weird because I was so happy to be there and listening to the music and just taking it all in. It actually was a text uh, and get this little bit of sad news. And it, it ended up being okay. You know, the sad thing that had happened, everything ended up being all right. But it was weird to have this moment of just complete joy and, and this sadness at the same time. And, you know, I had to tell myself to not be, feel bad for feeling the joy at the same time mm. I was feeling the sadness. Yeah, we do that. We won't allow ourselves. We don't understand that we can feel all that at the same time. And then we think we're we're being dishonest with ourselves. I should say me. I think I'm being dishonest with myself if I, if my emotions change. And then I question what kind of person I am. Yeah. And that's all okay if we could all just tell ourselves that it's not black and white and that there's nothing but gray area and we don't have to, you know, stay on one side or the other of anything ever. Right. Definitely. Amen to that. Yeah. I was going to ask you a little bit about a Willie Watson manufacturing company. Yeah. I noticed on your site as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I've been sewing and making my own clothes since I was in my mid-20s. 
And I started just by altering clothes that I'd get at thrift stores. I was on stage and playing bigger stages, feeling pretty good and feeling pretty important and wanted to look better than I had. So I wanted some skinnier pants. And in the early 2000s, it was impossible to find some skinnier pants. So I was buying women's jeans and taking in those bell bottom bottoms they all had. Then I was buying thrift store trousers and making them slimmer. I wanted to look like 60s stovepipe pants like Bob Dylan and the Beatles were wearing in mid 60s. So that's what started it by me just wanting skinnier pants. And I just ended up altering and altering and then making more alterations and more complicated alterations where I was taking stuff apart and seeing how how they went back together. And so then I just started from scratch and made tons of pants. It got to the point where Old Crow, we were getting ready to start pre-production on our second record and see what songs everybody had. And we were coming together in people's living rooms, sharing what songs we'd been working on. And everyone said, I got this song and this, and I wrote four last week. And I got this old song I think we should record. And I was like, well, I got a lot of pants. And I had to stop, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I was like, whoa, slow down, stop. <laughs> and I had jackets and shirts, all kinds of stuff. But it just, I was obsessed. I took over my life. And uh, and so I did stop and I didn't sew anything for maybe 10 years. And then I was on my own again and, and I was a dad. And I was interested in making my daughter some dresses and made her some cute little dresses that she could wear. Sparked some interest in making some clothes for myself again. So I started making shirts, pants and jackets again. And then made a dress for my daughter that I thought was unique and cool enough to offer to the world. People were always telling me, you made that shirt, you got to sell that stuff. And I'd say, no way, I don't have time for that. And that's like a whole other world of, it's like an industry that I don't know anything yeah. about. And I'm not going to get involved in that. But anyway, that dress was cool. And I decided to make an adult version, take some pictures of it, put it on a friend, put it on an Instagram page and see what happened. And people loved it and started ordering. And then they wow. saw that I was make, making my own jeans for myself. And they'd say, well, can't you make me jeans? And I'd say, absolutely not. That's an industry I'm not getting involved in. <laughs> um, but eventually I just kind of came around to it. Also, you know, it helped financially quite a lot. My solo career was, like I said, it was kind of falling off. People weren't coming to shows. Um, I hope they start coming to shows, but they weren't coming to shows and it helped me a lot um, financially. And also through COVID, it, once COVID came, I was like, oh, Whoa, yeah, that's why I started sewing. It's another, you know, one of those things that makes you believe in God just a little bit more. You know, oh, yeah. it was real handy to have that business when I couldn't tour. Oh, I bet it was. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, it is great. And I and I do love sewing still. And I make a lot of jeans and old vintage inspired heritage workwear. Um, among other things, we got some machines to make knits and we've been making sweatshirts and sweatpants for ourselves. But as far as the business side of it goes, man, like it was that industry that I was afraid to get into and it wore me out. It kind of hurt my back. It kind of made sewing not as fun. I'm, you know, putting the brakes on it. If someone wants to come along and say, hey, man, here's a hundred thousand dollars and I'll manufacture all this stuff and we'll make, you know, 300 jackets and 600 pairs of jeans then I'd be into that, but I don't want to sew everything myself anymore. Yeah, I'm, I imagine that's very labor intensive. Oh, yeah. I became a factory worker. <laughs> yeah, definitely another creative outlet. I always think it's interesting to see musicians and singers and writers, their other creative outlets. You know, and I should mention, and that's so it's been such an important part of the sewing side project for me, is that it helps me listen to music. And I would listen to music like that mm -hmm. as a teenager. I'd be painting or sculpting things out of clay in my room. And that's how I learned to listen to music. So it had been a part of my life that had been missing for a long time. And it really helped inspire a lot of these new songs and, you know, source material that gives you ideas. So it was a, a huge creative outlet. That's cool. That's really neat. Well, Willie, I just want to uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. And I just want to uh, encourage everybody out there to go to a Willie Watson show um, His uh, and go and listen to his music. Really amazing. Next Monday, be sure to check out our interview with Kim Ritchie. Here's a little taste of that interview on your website as well, that that's a, another thing that you really strive for is that connection with the audience. Are you thinking about that when you're writing or are you just in the moment? Not when I'm writing, not when I'm writing so much, more, more so when I'm performing, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the connection more so when I'm, when I'm recording. I think that if I'm just writing from a very honest place, which I, you know, do try to do all the time is, is that that's the way of connecting with people because then they can see themselves in the songs or so that's and the connection thing. There's that connection. And then there's also the performance connection. The best shows that, that I've ever 
play that come to mind were when I had a really great enthusiastic audience. And there's just mm -hmm. this energy thing that goes back and forth between the performers and the audience. And it just kind of keeps getting ramped up the more it goes back and forth. And it's just some of the most fun shows. It just depends on the audience. Right. Speaking of audiences, back in January, you were uh, in Mexico with Brandy Carlisle, uh, Mary Chapin Carpenter and Brandy Clark. Tell us a little bit about what that was like. Well, that was her, her festival. The girls just won a weekend. It wasn't just the four of us. There was also Annie Lennox played, Sarah McLaughlin, Wendy and Lisa, Allison Russell. It was a big festival, thousands of people there, you know, full bands and everything. And then they decided that they were going to do this kind of songwriter, take turns playing songs, acoustic. I wasn't sure that how that was going to work out because, you know, you had a big festival kind of sort of atmosphere. And we sat up on chairs up on stage, the four of us, and just took turns playing songs, solo acoustic. It was absolutely amazing. The whole vibe of that festival is fantastic. It's just really inclusive and, and positive. And it's just re really, really great festival. But we sat up there and played and the crowd response, like when we were playing, you could hear, you know, you could just about hear a pin drop. People were really quiet and respectful. The vast majority of those people out there had absolutely no idea who I was. And it was so overwhelming, the response. <laughs> Chapin and I, we just sat up there and cried. And then we'd have to stop crying when it was our turn to, you know, to <laughs> sing. But it was just, it was overwhelming. It was just one of one of my most uh, fantastic performance memories ever. And I remember I was playing I'm All Right and looked out at all, you know, thousands of people and they were doing the arm wave and singing along. And it was just, it was pretty darn amazing, I have to say. That's cool. Talk a little bit about the writers who have inspired you. Oh, uh, well, right. Johnny Mitchell for sure, you know, because I grew up in that in that time and listen to that music. Um, I think I come from the singer songwriter country folk rock kind of sort of scene, like all the California people, Jackson Brown and, and that I loved Carol King when I was little, I remember babysitting for some people one time and they had tapestry uh, and I would just play, play that over and over and over and over and over again. And so, and I also love Carla Bonoff. Uh, I listened to her a, a lot starting in college, but I think those women were definitely the most inspirational to me um, in songwriting. I also really love Steve Earle, and he was one of the reasons I came to Nashville because my friend Bill Lloyd, he, he was in a band uh, called Foster and Lloyd that did really well in the country scene in the 80s, the late 80s, I think it was. He sent me a tape. I was living in Bellingham, Washington at the time, and he sent me a tape of like, this is what's going on down here. Sent me Steve Earle's first record, Guitar Town, and I was like whoa those kind of lyrics were just amazing to me just i just respect his songwriting so much